Okay, well, it's four o'clock and we have now, we're closing in on 140 people that are still joining. So let's get started. Again, my name is Kate Thompson and I work at Crow Canyon. So I'm a, I coordinate academic travel seminars for Crow Canyon and I've been working there for about uh, eight years now. Um, I'll be moderating today's webinar featuring Katrina Blair, and the title is The Wild Wisdom, Essential Food and Medicine of the Land. And um, hang on a second while I share my screen here to get us going. So, yeah. Um, Katrina has been doing this forever, it seems, since so she was probably a toddler. I think she came out of the womb, you know, really uh, talking to plants. So, um, wild wisdom, the central food and medicine of the land. So, I just want to give a big shout out to everyone who made this possible. All these webinars, especially Dylan Schwent, Jen Pizzo, MJ Smith, and Taylor Hasbrook. So, thanks, y'all. It's been great. Um, to have this going for so many months. So if you're new to Zoom, I, here's a little tutorial where you can move the talking heads. Um, so when you see a little box, you know, feel free to click on it, move it around. There's on top of the talking heads, so on top of me talking, you might see a couple of squares and that middle square is Kind of my favorite setting where it's the speaker view. So the person speaking is, is who you'll see. If you want to see both me and Katrina side by side, you know, great. You can play around with those icons. Um, for questions, what we're going to do on this particular webinar is field mostly questions at the end so that Katrina can get into her flow and keep it, keep it rolling for us. But type in questions in the Q&A. Um, and that'll be great. So what happens there is any similar questions, we'll find a representative question um, so that we can get through this all in a timely manner. If you're having difficulties, you might want to jot this down. You can head over to our live stream at facebook.com backslash Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And afterwards, if you want to check this out, if something comes up, you can go to YouTube, recommend it to your friends. If you like this presentation, crocanion.org backslash YouTube. So go ahead and subscribe there if you'd like. And just to recap on our mission, many of you are familiar with us, but our mission, we um, drive our pr programs all from our mission. So it's to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. So again, check us out at crocanion.org. And for a heads up, you can join us next week um, for a Four Corners lecture series. And that's gonna be the archeology span of the Aztec North Great House with Dr. Michelle Turner. So tune in for that on Thursday, June 25th at 4 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. So with that, um, I'll introduce Katrina a little bit about Katrina. And, um, she began studying wild plants in her teens when she camped out alone for a whole summer to embrace a wild foods diet. She later wrote The Wild Edible and Medicinal Plants of the San Juan Mountains for her senior project at Colorado College. Katrina completed her MA at John F. Kennedy University in Orindo, California in holistic health education. She then went on and founded Turtle Lake Refuge in our very own Durango, Colorado in 1998. This is a nonprofit whose mission is to celebrate the connection between personal health and wild lands. Turtle Lake Refuge includes a wild local living foods cafe, sustainable education center, and community farm. Katrina teaches permaculture and wild edible and medicinal classes locally and globally. She is the author of several books, including the following, Local Wildlife, Turtle Lake Refuge's Recipes for Living Deep, 
And she also wrote The Wild Wisdom of Weeds. I love this book, 13 Essential Plants for Human Survival. So thank you, Katrina. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and get going. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Can you get that okay, Katrina? I think so. I have it here. Do you have it? I'm not seeing it yet. You're not seeing it. Oh, dear. Okay. Let's see if we can. So there's two things, share screen, and then um, it's like a little start thing. Okay. Um, do you see my screen? Do you see my screen? I see you. you see me. I'm not seeing your screen. All right. I'm going to see if, if that didn't happen. All right, share screen. Mm hmm And then uh, hit the start button, something like that. Hmm. I'm going to try again. Okay, so others can see your screen. Um, yeah. Need to select a specific image to share. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to start my slideshow from the beginning. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So for others, you might want to make your screen real big. So uh, do the full screen. So this looks beautiful. Thank you, Katrina. Yeah? Okay. Beautiful. I'm glad it works. Um, I think that was the hardest part. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm really happy to share um, my journey and hopefully some inspiration about the incredible abundance of food and medicine that grows in, in and around our homes. And these slideshows um, that I'm going to present, this slide show is more focused on the plants around Colorado and um, sort of the Southwest area. But a lot of these plants you'll find are familiar wherever you're watching from. There's so many common crossovers of the edible and medicinal plants. So hopefully you'll recognize some of these plants and, and feel a little more connection to um, go deeper in your knowledge and, and experience with these plants. And so a little bit about where I came to love the plants and, and learn from them my whole life was I grew up in Durango in the southwest of Colorado. I really fell in love with plants when I was about 11, 10, 11. I had this real strong experience where the plants actually took me. I was called to, I was on this lake and they called me over almost uh, away from my family who were all picnicking. And I paddled on this little air mattress and way around the corner and out of sight. And these plants on the bank on the shore called me over to crawl barefoot to the muck and sit down next to these plants. And when I got there, I just got euphoric, like this whole body experience of, of feeling like I was finally home. And these plants said, you're home and you're going to live your life with us. So really after that moment, it was, I just wanted to learn everything I could about the plants. And as Kate mentioned in the introduction, I decided to immerse myself right after high school just to learn the plants directly and taste and experiment. And I did have books, but I found that my knowledge base comes from um, immersing in the woods and really directly connecting with the plants and through um, through tasting and experiencing what the plants have to share to my body. A lot of my knowledge has come from that place. And of course, there's so many great books and resources um, that I continue to learn from. And luckily with with all of life, we never stop learning. In fact, the more you go deeper into one subject, the more infinite it becomes. So this first slide is just to show that, you know, here's 16 plants on the screen and there's Gamble's Oak and, you know, there's cattails and choke cherries and some incredible greens, mallow and elm leaves. And all of this was just harvested one day on an afternoon walk in November. 
And it's a whole, in a way, we can think of it as a whole shopping market. You know, there's this incredible food that the Garden of Earth is providing for us. And it was an exciting journey that that I personally am in, in passion today for. But really, this is from the past. This is the way humans um, have continued to live on the land. And I find such inspiration with cultures and peoples who are continuing to do this and keeping this knowledge alive. And if we can inspire our modern people in time culture to work this knowledge into this present time, it feels like it's going to benefit the health of all of humanity and the wisdom that our connection to our place to the earth. So I'm going to continue. Um, so some of these plants, you know, when I think about it, we are what we eat. And so it's an incredible opportunity to get connected to wherever we live, even if it's just going out and eating some pine needles or a dandelion, there's this immediate connection that we have when we are ingesting a plant. Kind of like the wild animals, which are some of my greatest teachers. All the wild animals that live on the earth pretty much eat their food locally, wild, and living, just fresh, directly. And so the minimal we process it or interfere with its growing, I've found personally just to receive an incredible amount of energy and inspiration from that. Um, and some of my journeys began high in the mountains where over 20 years ago, I started just taking these walkabouts where I wouldn't bring much food or any food, depending. And, and it changed from the wild plants being, oh, this is a great passion and a hobby to, wow, this is my total survival. And so it's been a journey of learning um, from these plants how incredible, uh, rich we are. Some of my journeys recently for the last, um, I don't know, 13, 14 years, I've hiked from Durango to Telluride, and it's about 90 to 100 miles and a lot of high elevation passes to cross through. So some of the food that I find there is down the high talus cracks of 13,000 feet areas or 12 or 13,000 um, feet passes. And yet, and so in the beginning when I would take these walks, I would bring some food with me, some apples and avocado but then one year I met this plant, which is a polygonum. It's a wild bistort. And it was in August and it was just loaded with these seeds. And as I ate the seeds, I realized there's so much fat and carbohydrate in these tiny little seeds. And it wasn't that hard to harvest them that it really broke through my own mind block that said, oh, I need other food to survive. It was this plant that I give credit to for really reminding me that this earth provides for us the food and medicine we need to live, especially when we do it in the wisdom way, which is the same, which is the way a lot of our indigenous cultures continue to think of how we sustain it. It's a reciprocal relationship of giving back and we don't over harvest and we don't process much because we can. So these are these seeds, these wild buckwheat seeds that were so nutritious and sustained me on my hikes. So after that moment, I actually stopped bringing food with me. And then I, I really entered into another dimension. But here's another, I'm just gonna go through a few of these slideshows. Some of these are high alpine plants, but then we're gonna get into the more common ones. So uh, this is an alpine sorrel that's very delicious and sour, tastes And again, when there's not much growing, this is a plant that can be very sustaining when you're at high elevation. But any of the needles, whether it's white fir or pine or spruce, they're all edible and they have an incredible amount of vitamin C. And you can eat them at all ages. They're just extra sweet. And you can taste them all and find out which one is your favorite. But it's an incredible source of MSM, which is really good for your joints, in addition to the vitamin C and chlorophyll. And so uh, pine needles, both just nibbling them, or you can make a tea, or sometimes I actually just collect the, the little needles and add them to my blender and make a juice. I strain out the fibers. And at the high elevation, there's so many flowers, and those are like candy. And these are alpine clover, but all the clovers, the flowers of clover, you can eat, and uh, they taste sweet. And there's a lot of nectar inside the blossoms. 
some years on my walk, I wouldn't bring actually food, but I would bring a salad dressing. And this is one year where I just brought the salad dressing, which has added a nice little flavor and a treat to my harvest. But there's there's bluebells in the salad and um, there's wild mustards and the bistort and all kinds of flowers and um, osha and wild parsley. But it's incredibly nourishing to eat directly from the land as fresh. I mean, as many of you may be gardeners, and so you may know this already about how high vitality the food is when you just pick it and eat it. And there's such a deep appreciation that comes along with this life force that's giving itself to you. And I find myself being so grateful and want to give back as well. These are wild violets, and they're all wild violets that are all edible, whether they're yellow flower or white flower or purple flower. You can eat the flowers and the greens, and they're very delicious and just a little bit demulcent, which means a little slimy. And that quality is so good for the skin and for healing. So sometimes what I do with this plant, if I ever get a skin uh, sensitive area, I chew up the leaves into a, a slimy mash, and I put that area um, I put the, the violet on there and it really heals very quickly by this plant and it's delicious. And then we have stinging nettles, which is another incredible mineral rich plant, really high in iron, fantastic to get rid of gout. And also if you have allergies, you can make a tea with this. I also like to eat the nettles raw, but you have to do it carefully. I usually pick another leaf nearby, like a dandelion leaf or a bluebell leaf, and I wrap it up inside and then I eat it very carefully and I don't get stung. But if you cook them or if you dry these nettles leaves, then you can eat them, no problem. Nettles is just one of these amazing plants that have such good fiber. The stalk, you can eat, after you harvest all the greens off, the stalk is a fantastic resource for making twine and necklaces and ropes and even clothing. And that's done all over the world because nettles is a plant that grows in so many different countries. And I choose my wild mouse and the berries are ripe, and that's actually an August run here. And so I remember one time on one of my hikes, I ate 19 different kinds of wild berries in one day, and it was a really delicious day. <laughs> but here we have strawberries, wild strawberries, and this one is a wild blueberry. We call it more like a bilberry. Um, they're very low growing and very rare, honestly, unless it's a real special year and then we'll have this bumper crop. And so sometimes I'll do the entire hike and I'll get one berry. And but it'll be the most nourishing thing I ate the entire thing because my excitement of getting that one berry was so great. I was so excited. And then other years I've found patches where I could eat a thousand of these little berries. And uh, it's kind of incredible how much nourishment can be out there but it is seasonal and it depends on the each year whether the snow comes late or if there's an early frost there's so many variables hey katrina yeah sorry, sorry to interrupt here um but yeah we're getting some scratchy audio from you so if oh. your tech person is there and might happen to know some people are commenting that it seems to get scratchy when you change slides but anyway just awareness and our apologies to everyone, but some of it's coming through and other parts are just scratchy, just so you're aware. So we oh, apologize. Okay. Yeah. It might be a bandwidth issue. I mean, the other thing that you can, can maybe try is just to um, try to stay back a little bit from the microphone in case okay. there's something about um, like air going into the microphone as you're speaking. I'm not I'm not right. sure. It's, it's hard to troubleshoot some of these things live, and we appreciate everybody's understanding. I'll also try to speak more clearly and a little slower, and I won't talk when I move the slide. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, this next slide is on the three-leaf sumac, which is Rus trilobata, the scientific name. Chilchin is its Navajo name. Squabush or lemonade berry has a lot of names and a lot of uses. This grows in the Southwest and is an incredible food and medicine plant and basket making, fiber making. But the berries are very delicious and sour and you can add them to a drink or make a meal with them. And also of course a tea, really rich in vitamin C. And then to be used, and I have not done this, but it's quite, 
um, an amazing plant because you can cut them back and then in the, in the springtime, and then they shoot up these long, very flexible and straight shoots to make baskets with. And here's a picture of Abe Sanchez gathering some of these sumac leaves um, or the stalks to make a beautiful basket. This basket was made by Dorlene gosh, with Sonoma. And um, sumac is just an incredible plant for so many uses. The hawthorn berries are also delicious. They're like a little mealy apple, but so nutritious. And it's, uh, it's full of pectin. And so if you ever wanted to make a pie, you can blend these berries fresh with a little bit of apple juice or some little sweetener. And then you have about one minute to strain out their seeds into your pie pan before it turns into jello. And it's the fastest pie you can make. You don't even have to cook it. You can serve it right in about two minutes. The wolf currants, um, there's a variety. There's four different varieties that grow around this region, but there's wild currants and gooseberry. They're kind of common names that get interchanged, but they're all edible and they have different flavors and looks. We have this one purple one that's a little fuzzy, and then we have a, a succulent gooseberry that's very sweet and uh, tender, and then the red wild wax currants that are very abundant. And actually, they're fantastic because sometimes they're ripe and really sweet, but a lot of times for me to the mushroom festival because I don't bring a stove. And sometimes I want to eat the mushrooms. Uh, I don't, and the other mushrooms I don't. And so I use these berries to cook. And I'll talk a little more about that later. So we get very delicious and very sour. Here's another picture of the Oregon grape that is. This year, we're going to have a very big harvest, a very big abundance of this berry. And there's no way um, you can um, over harvest in certain areas around my house because there's just so much and it's too hard to harvest them. <laughs> so I find that I, I do it gently and carefully, making sure that next year these plants are going to thrive again. But these are a delicious thing that Turtle Lake Refuge, which is our nonprofit, we make wild granola. Well, we, we make wild food for our community and we put these Oregon great berries in our granola. We dry them. And there's the wild raspberries, um, you know, and anything that comes from the wild area, there's some real charm because it's in such a pristine environment up here in these mountains, at least. Um, but even when it's in the city and I go and I pick a dandelion from the city, it still has this wild intelligence that I find so nutritious. Um, anything More than anything I could buy at the store because it has growing right from the land and it's it's got its own intelligence and um, incredible wisdom that it has sharing with us when we eat it. Another delicious berry called Twisted Stock. And thimbleberry, amazing food. How Patrick, is the connection? I might try to stop your video and see if that improves the audio quality at all. And okay. To see you, but it may, may just make things look a, uh, and sound a bit better. To do that, do I? I I'll do things? that, but then you, you'll you have to start your video again if we turn it when you turn it back on. So. And how will I start it again? Um, it will be on the lower lower left hand part of your screen where it says mute or mute, there's a would be a stop video but or start video button there okay okay let's try that go ahead am i am i still am i still can you hear me yeah we can hear you okay so i'll just keep going so this is thimbleberry and another amazing berry, a lot like raspberry. And then 
service berries are, this was a service berry pie, but the whole pie was just berries and flowers. Again, another incredible sustaining food. And a lot of these berries, of course, aren't available all year round. So harvesting them and drying them or freezing them is the way to preserve it. And we make little cookies, almost like I can get meat to eat. wild choke cherry. Some years we have such an abundance of choke cherries that we dry them into these little cookies. It's with choke cherries, apples, coconut, and dates. And that's a way where we can have choke cherries all year round. So in addition to the wild greens, this is the osha plant uh, with some mushrooms. And the osha is an incredible medicine plant that I love to eat the greens when I'm hiking. And then occasionally in the early spring or the late fall, I will harvest a few roots to sustain me through the winter. But I find I actually like to harvest the osha greens and dry them and use those greens throughout the winter as well. And the osha is so good for the lungs and for our immune system, as well as just helping us handle high elevation. So the mushrooms are part of my, my diet, although there are poisonous plants and poisonous mushrooms that we have to be careful of. This is an Amanita muscaria that will be turning into this beautiful red polka dotted uh, mushroom that's not an edible mushroom. And so as we are on this journey to learn about what we can eat, there are things we have to learn not to eat just with the plants and the mushrooms. Um, with the mushrooms, there's really common delicious ones called chanterelles, which are, they smell like apricots and are very delicious. And when I'm eating, when I'm eating them in the woods, I find that I don't like to eat chanterelles raw. So I either, I this is an example of how I prepared them back at home. But when I'm in the woods, I'll use wild berries, and that's a picture of the sumac berries. And then I also use the sour gooseberries and the wild strawberries. And that you can marinate it in a little bit of the juice, and they're delicious. And there's plenty of other incredible edible mushrooms like the blue chanterelles or the king bolites, the hawk's wing, the giant puffball. And this is one that these next two, the giant puffball and the king bolete are two mushrooms that I actually do like to eat raw when I'm hiking. And the one thing with mushrooms, I will never eat a mushroom unless it's just absolutely perfect. You know, if I'm on my hike, it has to be just poking out of the ground and the bugs have not gotten to it yet. And then it makes an amazing meal. But it goes a long way. One mushroom can really take you far. <laughs> so I'd like to transition and just talk a little bit about our nonprofit, which is the Turtle Lake Community Farm and our Wild Food Cafe. And so we have this four acre farm where every plant on the farm is sacred and has value. And that includes all the wild weeds, the ones that we don't plant. In fact, they even have more um, knowledge and wisdom for us than the plants we do cultivate. And so we are a mix between planting intentionally and utilizing all the wild foods mixed in. One of the, the gardens that we grow is a the four sisters or the three sisters labyrinth garden, which is the pea, corn, bean, and squash. But I have found through my time that there's always a fourth sister, this wild amaranth plant that comes up. And honestly, it's that plant, the amaranthus rectroflexus, that has the most abundant harvest. Because when you put the four, well, when you place bean, corn, and squash, they're so beautiful because you'll get 
all a complete protein, as well as you'll have different spatial relationships for the plants to grow, where the corn grows up and the beans go up the corn, and then the squash grows really wide. And then the amaranth fills in all the gaps. And the amaranth is a complete protein all by itself. So we harvest these wild amaranth seeds, which are tiny little black seeds packed with protein. And then we, we winnow the seeds with the wind. They're really pokey, so we have to use gloves sometimes, but you can let the wind blow off the shaft and then it's the seeds that remain. And we make a dried dehydrated cracker with the seeds that again is a high protein food that helps us to sustain our energy throughout the rest of the year. And lamb's quarters is another amazing plant that is a high protein plant, a complete protein plant filled with nutrition. It actually has more than 60% of the nutrition coming from cultivated spinach. And it is a relative of spinach, it's a wild spinach, but so packed with iron and minerals. And the seeds of the lamb's quarter turn into quinoa, a type of quinoa. There's so many different varieties, over 200 species of lamb's quarter, but each one makes its own seed, which is an edible seed full of protein. And I'm gonna show you one other incredible plant that we also harvest the seeds from commonly, and that's the yellow or the curly dock, which is the Rumex crispus. And these green leaves are very delicious when they're young, they're sour, like a sour spinach, but as they get older, they can accumulate oxalic acids and then they're too hard to eat. But the root is very medicinal all the time. It's very tonifying for the, the, the skin and all the vital organs and actually the teeth and the gums by making a tea with the root. And then the, the seeds are harvested. We like to harvest them and make into bread. And I mix the seeds with another grain. It could be oats or another kind of buckwheat. Grind it up and then make a sun bread that I'll either bake in the sun or you can bake in the oven or put on a dehydrator sheet. But it's an incredible source of nutrients in the form of bread. And mallow, Malva neglecta, another incredible plant for so many reasons. Edible seeds and flowers and greens and roots. We use the greens to make a, a sprouted rye breadstick and the roots can be blended into a milk that's very creamy and nutritious. And even the greens, a little bit slimy, but make an amazing skin healing um, addition to a bath or a face mask, but it helps regenerate the skin cells, just our common little wild mallow. So one way that we like to help educate about these wild plants into our community is we have a, a wild food CSA. And our CSA actually starts tomorrow if you're in our area. And once a week, you get a goodie bag of all these amazing wild foods. And it could be things that we just harvest fresh for you to make a green juice with, or it might be something we made like a wild jam from a berry or um, a wild salad mix with salad dressing. Anyway, it's an educational way to integrate the wild diet back into our daily practices. We might use Gamble's Oak, which is our local acorn, which we're so blessed because the Gamble's Oak, it does not have as many tannic acids as some of the Eastern and, and Western Oaks. So we can eat them right off the tree or we can grind them into a milk. And even the shell, after we crack the shell, you can roast the shell and make a delicious coffee from the acorn. So I'm finding for me that one of my purposes is to really support my community in integrating the wild foods back into our diet, especially the wild weeds that grow so abundantly around where we live. And I just feel that the more wild food that we eat, our entire community has more integrity. We can withstand challenges a little easier because the wild foods helps us to be more resilient. So one of the ways we do that is we offer this wild food cafe, it's a turtle cafe, and it, it's a very educational lunch where we'll integrate dandelions into the pesto and burdock into the soup. And it's a great way for people to meet each other and have a meal that is supporting your own health, 
and the earth's health, as well as our community health. And, you know, with the wild weeds, they're so valuable as a form of food and medicine because they grow right where we live and they're actually helping remediate our disturbance of land. So their niche is disturbed soils and humans are so good at disturbing land that these wild weeds come in to help regenerate fertility back to the earth through their deep tap roots, bringing all these nutrients into their leaves. And then when their leaves compost, they've actually brought more nutrients back into the topsoil. And in the meantime, these wild weeds are incredible pollinator forage for the pollinators. And if we harvest them as humans, they also help clean house for us. So they make our own bodies more, um, we, they help us detox and get rid of toxins. And so I'm a beekeeper as well. And I find that the bees are, and all the wild pollinators are such an important teacher right now. Anything that's good for the bees, let's do that. And anything that's really harmful to the bees, let's stop doing those things immediately. And one of those things is using herbicides or pesticides on public land. And I find that that's a big mission for me personally is to really educate how, how that doesn't help. And this is a picture I took of a preschool where they had just sprayed and they're telling the poor kids to not come there. But unfortunately, the bees don't have that option. They go to where the nectar is. And if it's the thistle plants that are being sprayed, it's going to lower the, this, the, plant, the bees' immune system. So the beautiful thing about thistles is that you can eat the entire thistle plant. The greens make an amazing green juice, very alkalinizing and healing to the blood. And the roots are incredible for um, healing the liver. So I grew up drinking a green juice once a day. Here's our bicycle blender with some amazing kids blending up some juice. But this green juice is something that I recommend doing once a day, a green juice. And it really prevents a lot of medical problems because it helps alkalinize our body. It provides enzymes, essential enzymes for digesting and metabolizing. And it provides incredible minerals. And you can make a green juice with some wild foods like thistle or dandelion or mallow or plantain or purslane. Or you can make a green juice with things like spinach or parsley or things you get at the store. We like to integrate the thistle root into a chai tea that we sell at the farmer's market. And it's interesting, it's ironic because these thistles are actually one of the most common plants that, the, that are trying to get eradicated because they're considered noxious weeds or they're invasive. And yet the herbicides that are being used to get rid of them is so detox is so toxic to our liver that it's actually the thistle root that is the remedy for the poison to kill the plant. So I say let's just go directly to embracing the wisdom of this plant and utilizing it as our food and medicine. And dandelions are another amazing food and medicine that are the very first flower that often the pollinators need for their spring honey. And again, the entire plant of the dandelion is edible from the root to the stems, to the flowers, to the leaves, and of course, the greens. And we utilize all parts of the dandelion in our recipes at the cafe. We even have a dandelion festival that we, um, have, we've done for the last 10, 11 years, and it's to promote organic land practices. We've asked our city of Durango not to spray herbicides on the public parks so that the kids and the bees and all the creatures don't be exposed, don't get exposed to these chemicals. And it's successful. It's working. We have um, eight or nine organic parks in our town and more and more education around how we just don't have to spray herbicides on the land at all anymore. So Turtle Lake Refuge, um, our nonprofit our mission is to celebrate the connection between personal health and wild lands. And I think if we look back into our past and even our present moment, when a group of people, when an indigenous group of people or a community of people is really connected to their home, the land they live on, and really know the plants, they know the food and the medicines of the plants that live on the same home as they do, that makes for a strong community and a healthy and wise 
um, future generations. Thank you so much. I'd love to field it for questions now. Um, yeah, so great. Thank you, Katrina. And um, undo your video so we can see you again. That would be wonderful. Maybe um, Dylan can do that. I can try, but I didn't, I don't know how. Okay. Well, maybe start my video. There it is. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Okay, Yay, you're back. Um, and I apologize to everyone. So what we're experiencing all throughout Southwest Colorado is um, internet. Um, you know, low bandwidth. I think it has to do with the smoke. And then it got Katrina, just for FYI, it got really clear, like halfway through your presentation, we could hear again. And, okay. Um, yeah. So thanks everyone for hanging in there. And we just have uh, some questions coming in right now. So the first one, um, oh, this is great. Have you observed fewer natural foods like berries in Colorado as a result of climate change and, and some other things like late freezes that kill the new berries. Um, someone's noting that it seems also that it's most noticeable when starving bears come down to towns. Just what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, there's a big, um, there is a big change of patterns at times. We had a huge snow year a couple winters ago that really all the berries were just two weeks to a month late because the snow was so deep. And then some years we don't have so much rain and the berries, sometimes they actually explode. They know they don't have much water and rain. And so they put on an extra harvest just because they don't know if they're gonna make it. So they wanna make sure those seeds get into the ground. So there's a lot of variables and every year I notice changes and it's directly related to the climate. And that could be a seasonal and a kind of an ecosystem change or a bigger change. Um, and then with the bears, yeah, the bears come down to our town every year, and luckily there's enough fruit trees and wild berries in and around town. Hopefully there's enough. Um, I always am kind of aware to make sure that there's, like we don't harvest enough to make a big impact on, on that, but it sure is nice to just know that there is enough for them, especially as humans continue to develop and clear really important habitat for the wildlife. Thank you, Katrina. Yeah, and we're we're breaking up a little bit more, but we'll we'll just suffer through it. So okay. be patient, everyone, as the smoke comes and goes and interferes. Um, one of the first questions that we got when you started was, "What herbs would help with osteoporosis and arthritis?" Great. Well, my mom had arthritis, extreme arthritis, when she was seventeen, and she went through uh, twelve years of Western medical drugs and surgeries and actually when I was two years old she did a juice fast and after four days of just juicing the massive amount of pain that she'd experienced chronically was gone and she woke up it was a huge epiphany for her and so ever since then she raised my brother and I on drinking two green juices a day so before breakfast and again before dinner and that's what she uses currently she doesn't have arthritis anymore even though almost every joint in her body has been replaced surgically, she doesn't have active arthritis. And she uses green juice, the chlorophyll from fresh green juice, as her pain medication. And what it does is it decongests the joints the body. And with osteoporosis, it's interesting. We want minerals. We want good calcium, but a, but a sil assimilatable calcium. And sometimes when we take it a, from a pill, our body can't digest it because it's too concentrated. So getting minerals and chlorophyll from plants is the best way that I would recommend for moving past those degenerative di diseases or conditions. They're not diseases as much as they're a condition for a time, but when we shift our body's chemistry and our diet, they can go away. And I've experienced that with my mom so directly. And honestly, she's the pioneer for me. She's why I have she taught me to be the master of my own health. And then my dad, who's a mountaineer, opened to the wild, opened the door to the wild for me. And so together, those two have really guided my path towards optimal health. Wonderful. Uh, what a beautiful story, Katrina. Um, here's another one. What do you know about Four Corners wild potato? Solanum uh, jam, jamisai? jamisai? Well, um, the... 
the potato family in general can be toxic. So you got to be a little cautious with that family. There are a lot of wild potatoes. I don't know that specific variety. It's not ringing a bell right now. But there's another wild potato in its common name called salsify. And it's actually in the aster family, but it has a delicious edible root that I use like a potato. Um, so I hope that helps a little. <laughs> yeah, and here's a more philosophical tone. If you are har harvesting wild, how do you replenish nature? So I, I do three things. I first, I ask permission and I really listen. And if it says no, I don't harvest it. And then I only harvest what I need and that never abundance. And I don't, I don't harvest for commercial. It's only for my friends and family and um, my community. And then I always say thank you. And I say thank you every time I pick a plant and eat it. It's just an automatic thing now. So I say it, I feel it. I also like to sing and I like to spit, sometimes give the plants water. And I also like to bring seaweed, a little bit of kelp. And I sprinkle that onto the plants to give them more nutrients for the soil. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, yeah, and I'm reading just a comment in the chat section um, that they grow on Mesa Verde and they were used by Pueblo people in the past. So it's really um, been in the uh, record and on um, publications lately. So it's very oh, exciting. Good. Good. Here's one on um, dandelion. Can you elaborate, please, on the different nutritional uses of the dandelion? And while you're at it, why not buck buckwheat, too? Uh, well, dandelion has more calcium than milk. And so another plant, great for the osteoporosis condition, but just for strong bones, so that if we ever break a bone, we heal quickly. And I like to use the greens uh, in a green juice or a smoothie. And I like to use the roots like a potato. You can cook it up or add soups. You can also eat it raw. And the flowers are very sweet. They taste like pollen or honey. And you can add those to your salads. And the seeds are also very nutritious. And you can grind the seeds into a milk. Sometimes I add another kind of a seed, like a sunflower seed, blend it with water and strain it. And these are all great ways to get the nutrition from the dandelion, which dandelions are a perennial plant and they have very, very deep tap roots. And those tap roots pull up the earth minerals that we don't get in our conventional food sources. And we need the entire rainbow of trace minerals to be healthy. And so it's the dandelion and our bodies for full integrity. And the buckwheat honestly is very similar. <laughs> it's different, but it offers incredible integrity of minerals too, because it's also the curly dock is a deep packed uh, perennial plant. And so the greens of dock are just incredible, high in iron and so replenitive to the blood. All right, and one about um, service berries. So I think you that part was where the audio was getting pretty difficult. Okay. Um, so if we could elaborate just a bit. Uh, would you do a quick overview on the service berry? Yeah. Service oh, berries are just so delicious and joyful. They taste like a wild blueberry and they grow on a tree, kind of a bush, and you can just eat them fresh. And they're a little bit uh, gelatinous and they have a lot of pectin also. So eating a little bit of them is just a great way to move the, the bowels, you know, move the system along. I can't stop eating them when I get around them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Someone, yeah, and you mentioned CSAs, so maybe just give a quick definition of that because some people don't know what that is. Okay. Yeah, see, well, a typical CSA is a community-supported agriculture, and it's a way where a farmer can get a family to buy a share, and it might be, let's say, $300 for the season. And then once a week, the entire season of growing, they get a box of food. And it's a way that the farmer can have financial support and the community gets this amazing food, and it's really dependent on what the farm has so that's the season, so it works. So we do one with the wild food on a lesser scale, um, but it, we call it the uh, CSA Community Support Abundance, and so we're, we just give you a bag of weeds once a week. It's great. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not quite like that. It's educational. Uh, we can just let's say I give you curly back 
root. And then it's how do you make this into a medicinal tea? Or we'll give you a bag of salad greens with wild greens and a salad dressing. And uh, it's a whole, um, it's very creative and fun to learn about this local food and medicine. Great. And then a clarification, um, because we have so much OSHA in our mountains, um, OSHA is similar to hemlock. So are there any good ways that you can recommend to distinguish between the two? Thank you for asking that question. That's a very important one. Yeah, the, there's a lot of uh, lookalikes to parsley. And there's a lot of lookalikes to parsley family, but two of the most poisonous plants are in the parsley family. And that's poison hemlock and water hemlock, both of which you don't even want to taste. They're that strong. And OSHA looks a lot like poison hemlock. And it's a white umbrella flower with parsley leaves. If you harvest OSHA, um, you know it's OSHA for lots of reasons. One of them is that you want to make sure you're above 10,000 feet in elevation because there's no poison hemlock or poison water hemlock that grows at that elevation. Then also you want to make sure it's OSHA by the smell. OSHA has this really pungent smell. Once you've smelled it, you know it's OSHA. And it's like a very strong celery. And the other thing is the, the root when it pops up into the, here's the ground surface, when the root pops up right at that, that, that point of contact, there's these little hairs. So OSHA roots are very hairy. And uh, poison hemlock, which, is, which doesn't grow above 10,000 feet, but there are some places in the elevation where they both can grow. But poison hemlock has purple polka dots on the stem and smells bad. Thank you, though. There are poisonous plants to be really careful about. Yeah, um, and there were some about berries, but let's move forward for the sake of time. Uh, let's see, when harvesting wild weeds from disturbed areas near towns, do you have concerns about contaminants in the soil or plant tissues from herbicides, et cetera? Another fantastic question, really important. You know, we live in the 21st century and there's Chemicals everywhere. There's toxins everywhere. You know, we, even just cars and their exhaust. It it goes on the land, and it goes into the waterways. So, I personally have um, come to realize that okay, I'm not going to get away from all of that. And in fact, um, the wild plants can help me detox my environment. When when I've got the tag get exposed to something, it's the wild greens, especially it's the greens that help us chelate to toxins and get it out of our system. So the first choice is, yeah, we don't want to harvest a plant that's been compromised by chemicals. And so it's really important that we use our observations that we really look at, we check in with where, what's happened to this land. We ask questions and we notice. And then we also ask the plant. And when I'm asking, is it okay for me to harvest you? I'm tuning into that question. Are you safe? For me and am I is it okay for me to harvest you and if the plant looks twisted or doesn't look healthy then I don't harvest it and I also advise people to don't harvest right on the side of the road you know go farther away if you can but we do the best we can I I find also that I prefer to eat a wild dandelion from New York City in Central Park than I would even something that I could buy from the store because of that wild intelligence and so I also Use your intuition, make the best choices you can, and then I have to let go at a certain point of, you know, we can't control the whole world, so. Great right, question. and there's some other questions that are similar to that, like even coming from the East Coast, so it sounds yeah. like, yeah, use your intelligence, your judgment, and ask the plant. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I guess there are some real toxic places, and the plants can take up toxins into the not every plant but certain plants can actually concentrate some chemicals in them so doing a little research and using your tongue if the plant is burny or tastes off then spit it out and that's just really important in your journey of wild food eating you can hear it from me or read it in a book but I'm not the ultimate authority you are and your body is so smart that really ask and make sure that you're the one in charge and your body will tell you how much you want or if at all. Here's a really sweet one about a recipe, um, and I'll read it 
quote, my great grandma used to make a dish called qualities with a weed that grows outside of her farm. It's supposedly a wild spinach. And I was wondering if you were familiar with what that plant is. I am. Yeah. Calitas. And it's a, it is lamb's quarter, which is the wild spinach and it's very delicious and so nutritious. Calitas. Nice. And a wonderful comment about CSAs um, to everyone to check your local farmer's market. Um, they're almost everywhere now throughout the United States. So um, tune into that. Also, Katrina, if you, uh, let's see, um, how to find out about some of your classes on permaculture and all the wonderful classes you offer. You can visit turtlelakerefuge.org and that will list some of our classes. And I am teaching a wild plant permaculture class in July. And then I'm also offering a local wild living soil course, and it's a two month course in September. And they're both located in Durango um, this year. And, and then I'll, we'll just keep posting, updating um, classes they come. I do have a local wild walk. You know, it's a free class that our San Juan Mountain Association is hosting. And then I, I'm doing something with Pro Canyon um, later next year. So they there are classes that will keep coming up. But um, Turtle Lake Refuge is where you can find that information. Nice. Um, do you ship items from your cafe, some foodstuffs? Yeah, we have a little store and we don't ship the perishable treats but we have dried goodies and we have a a wild green powder which is all the wild greens from our area we dry into a we call it a superfood green powder and it's an incredible nutrient mineral supplement of just the wild plants dried so there are things that um ship well and we do have a little store um, on our website wonderful thank you um yeah. Well, this has been really fun, and again, our apologies on our smoky signals here. Um, some audio that came and got, went, you know. <laughs> so thanks for tuning in, and if you want to know more, of course, about Crow Canyon and Turtle Lake, Lake Refuge, um, you can both Google us and find it on the web. Yes. So Really appreciate you all being there. I wish I could see all your faces as well, but hello. <laughs> Nice to meet you all. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time, and hopefully we have clearer skies and better Internet service. So thanks for hanging in there. We love you all. Thank Take you. care.